So have you ever said something and instantly wish you could take it back? I mean, sometimes the mouth starts working faster than the brain does, and you want to hit that pause button, rewind a bit, and say the whole thing over again. A do-over. We love do-overs. Options, choices, second chances. I mean, it's the hallmark of our American society, isn't it? As a generous and forgiving people, we love to give people that second chance, that second opportunity. And on the consumer level, there's hardly anything that you can't just scrap and do over, or at least get another one. You're in a restaurant eating, and the food that they bring you isn't what you thought it was going to be, what you ordered off the menu. Just complain about it to the manager, and the manager will usually come and give you whatever you want off that menu to make up for it. Consumers are always right. So you have a 30-day return policy. You go out and purchase that ultra high def big screen TV for the Super Bowl. You watch the Super Bowl and two days later after it, you take it back and get your money back. Even big events in life can be reversed. If you act quickly enough, you can get your marriage annulled. It's like the wedding never happened. If you don't like your name, change it like Meta World Peace did. If you're drowning in unhealthy consumer debt, bankruptcy will wipe it out. Lawyers can even find loopholes in so-called irrevocable trusts. <laughs> Nothing seems permanent. Nothing seems irrevocable. That's such a strong word, isn't it? Irrevocable. So final. It comes out of your mouth with a thud. Irrevocable. Finished. Done. Final. So what in life are truly irrevocable things? Well, a bullet can't go back into a gun once it's fired. You squeeze too much toothpaste out and you can't get it back into the tube. You hit the send button on your email and you can't retrieve it. You can't unscratch a lottery ticket. And according to Johnny Cash, if you name your son Sue, it will have irrevocable consequences. Well, in today's lesson from Romans chapter 11, we are confronted with a God of certain irrevocables. This is a sticky text in a sticky section of a sticky book. It's in this section where theologies and dogmas take shape, where exegetes draw lines in the sand, where rapture disappearing humans of the dispensational bent splash around as happy as a dog in a wading pool on a hot summer day. Romans 9 through 11 present us with a cadre of questions like, so what is the role of the Jewish people now that Jesus has come as Messiah? Who are the chosen people of God? The Jews only? Christians only? Or both? To what extent is God's election? Does God predestine some to hell as well as to heaven? And is there salvation for the Jewish people apart from faith in Jesus as Messiah? All these questions arise out of this section of Scripture. And while there's a lot of questions that come up, it's still a good section for us to consider, especially us who live in this relativistic world. You know, the axiom of most millennials is, your truth is not my truth, I will determine what is truth to me. But you really can't be a true relativist in this, in this world of ours. I mean, there are some absolutes that you just have to have. Like, most relatives absolutely believe in gravity. Duh. You have to have some basis for things. But in this section, 
St. Paul presents us with two irrevocable truths about God when he says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What are the gifts and the calling of God? First, the gifts. We find out that the first irrevocable is that we are a people of mercy. Scripture plainly acknowledges that seasons of blessing are temporary. Rains come and go. Crops boom and bust. You know, the wheat can freeze out one year and the next year they have a bumper record harvest. Riches are transient. But the irrevocable that Paul is talking about here comes from a divine attribute of God, his divine love. In spite of the disobedience of his people, Paul says that the mercy of God is irrevocable, that he might have mercy on all. Perhaps the heart of a parent can understand showing mercy in spite of disobedience. Because the heart of a parent values relationship over retribution. Values the future over the past. And here's where this word irrevocable comes into play. The Greek root for this also means without regret. Something given with no claim to a do-over. I read recently in a Time magazine that in the Catholic Church, confession is becoming a thing of the past, that it's declining rapidly. I guess confessing your sins in this relativistic therapeutic world is just not trendy. But that's why we keep the language of corporate confession within our worship service, where we say we have sinned against others by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Now the place of confession and repentance for us is not a place of grief or self-abasement. It is a place of honesty. Yeah, we might regret our sins. Hopefully we do regret our sins. But we are not shamed to claim them. Because by claiming our sins honestly, in the same breath we're claiming God's mercy, which he promises to give. The gift of God's mercy is irrevocable. The second irrevocable is that we are a people of mission. That is our calling. Now in this text, Paul is confronting us with two major topics here. One, that the true people of God are those who follow him in faith, not necessarily those who are just of the bloodline of the Jewish race. And two, that God's kingdom is constantly expanding. Thus, St. Paul says that salvation has come to the Gentiles. So, here's the irrevocable. If God is changing his salvation history because of the disobedience of Israel, there must be something going on here that's really great. I mean, if he's going to change salvation history to include the Gentiles, what exactly is that disobedience of the Israelites? Well, if you look at the Old Testament prophets, they point out two major things that God got on the people of Israel about. One is worshiping other gods, and secondly, that their injustice toward others, especially the poor. And this goes back to the very founding of the Jewish people, to, back to Genesis 12, to their DNA, where God gives Abram his marching orders as his chosen people. He tells Abraham that I will bless you and make your nation and na- make your name great. 
that all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. They were to be the blessing for the, for the not yet blessed. The family for the not yet family. They were, to, they were chosen as God's people to extend God's people. So here's the irrevocable truth here. To be a part of God's family is to be in mission. That's part of the DNA that God works into his people. That truth is what is to be the life of God's current people. To be a non-missional Christian is to be distorted from the design that God has created. Quite simply, a non-missional Christian is an oxymoron. It should be as rare as a sixth finger. But what does it be, mean to be in mission? Most of the times when we think about mission work, we think about going elsewhere to do mission work, like Tanzania to talk among the Skuma people, or going on a mission trip to paint a house, or clean a yard, or put food together for a food, shell, uh, a food uh, pantry somewhere. Yes, that is mission work. But mission work also takes place right here where God has planted you. I would expect that over half of us here aren't natives of Wichita. Most of us were moved here to Wichita probably because of our vocations, our jobs. And you may think, oh, it's just, you know, a fate of nature. It's just part of the world that I ended up here in Wichita. But if you're thinking that way, what you're suggesting is that God has no control over history. That God has no control over your life. God brought you here for a reason. And one of the reasons he brought you here is to be in mission. Mission work is what you do in your community around you, right here. A recent study said that less than a third of the population of Wichita attends church on a regular basis. My neighbors in my cul-de-sac don't go to church regularly, but I'm working on that. You know, when we get together for dinners, of course, they know what I do, so they ask me to pray because only a pastor can pray at a meal, right? <laughs> Look, speaking the truth of God's word, serving non-believers, that's mission work. And we have a large mission field right here where God is has planted you. So what St. Paul is telling us today, that in this world where little is permanent, we are, as God's people, irrevocably a people of mercy, his mercy showered upon us, and we are a people of mission. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Bottom line, God does not give up on the commitments he has made. Even though it seems to us that <laughs> things are not working out. But that's good. It wasn't God's ideal that this world would be corrupted by sin, but since it has, he worked his plan of salvation to bring his son Jesus to rescue us. And he did rescue us. God's promises are certain. You and I are a commitment of God. God never gives up on us. He promises to be there when we confess our sins. He promises to be with us when we stand before the Almighty Judge, cleansing us of our sins. Because God's promises are sure. St. Paul says it so clearly. The gifts and the promises of God are irrevocable. How do we know? Because God is God. 
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith that we share with one another by speaking together the words of the Nicene Creed. Together we confess, I